Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to start with a, a bit of a story. It's 1965 in Hungary, and a young man, maybe a strange man named Laszlo Polgar, is facing a monumental challenge. He's trying to convince a woman to marry him. Now, this is a challenge because, well, he was looking for a woman who, in his own words, was willing to jump on board with an experiment he wanted to test. That experiment, that theory he wanted to put to the test is that geniuses are not born, they're made, they're educated, they're trained. And he wanted to test it on his own family. So, ladies, want to experiment on your own children? I don't know about you. He wanted to actually make his kids to be chess prodigies. This was the goal. This was what he advertised to women that he was interested in. Uh, well, fortunately for Laszlo, there's apparently someone out there for everybody. He managed to find a woman willing to jump on board, and soon he's not only married to this woman, but he's got three beautiful daughters. These daughters, all three girls, um, are set straight to work. Laszlo begins raising them to be chess prodigies, teaching them the game, teaching them strategy, playing the game with them every single day, multiple times a day. Now, whatever you think of Laszlo and his theory, it seems to work. The oldest daughter, Susan, was beating adults within six months of starting at age four. The next is even better. Sophia was a world championship chess player at 14, competing against all kinds of girls from all around the world who were her age. But Judith, the youngest daughter, was even better. At 12, she wasn't just good among girls her age, she was among the top 100 chess players in the world. And at 15 years and four months, she became the then youngest international chess grandmaster of all time, male or female. All three girls would eventually go on to achieve that coveted title, grandmaster. Far from a tortured childhood, the girls actually say they enjoyed their upbringing, that opportunity to play chess all the time. They, they enjoyed it. But let's not forget how this happened. Their crazy dad <laughs> decided from before they were born to raise them to be chess masters. He had an identity in mind for them, and he gave them habits to match. And this story seems particularly appropriate for us to talk about in light of our being challenge, as we talk about the habits that we have as Christians, the habits we choose as Christians to grow in relationship to God. Now, as we think about this, I want to ask an important question in light of these three girls. Does our identity shape our habits? Or is it more appropriate to say that our habits make us who we are, shape our identity? Because I think based on the story, the answer is a little bit of both, isn't it? The girls would never have been chess masters if their dad hadn't given them habits of a chess master, shaped their lives around the game of chess. But likewise, their dad would never have shaped their lives around chess if he hadn't chosen the identity for them of chess master. Their identity shaped their habits, their habits shaped their identity, and I think it's true for us that the habits that we have chosen each of us as individuals grow out of, come out of our identities, and then they shape who we are too. They shape our actions, they shape our desires, they shape our dreams. And as I say all of this, I can't help but think about my own kids, especially Theo. You might think I'm raising my son to be a pastor, and to a certain degree, there, there might be a ring of truth there. We read Bible stories often. We, we sing a hymn and say prayers every night before bed. 
He's a regular in Sunday school, Christian day school. He's, he's always here in church, and I'm sure that he'll get his fair share of people expecting him to want to be a pastor when he grows up. But if I'm honest, the habits we've given Theo are more in line with him growing up to be a musician. He's taking piano lessons. He's, we've bought him I don't know how many musical instruments. We've, uh, he sat on my lap weekly over there in choir as we had choir rehearsals for the first year or two of his life. And these things show. Not only does he have a, a rare and, and, and special gift called perfect pitch at this point in his life, but he understands music theory better than most adults. He, he at, his, at a Sunday school lesson recently, like six months ago probably at this point, told his Sunday school teacher, oh, I prefer that song in F major. And then at a piano lesson just this past week, he was asked to, to play a song, and he did, both hands, chords and all, and then he didn't like it in that key, so he transposed it on the fly without prompting his own choice into C major, and then he said, oh, I don't like that one either, so he transposed it into G major afterwards. <laughs> And I was just sitting there with my mouth hanging open, and his piano teacher's mouth was hanging open. And, and did I mention he's four years old? <laughs> it's crazy. But in our house, we foster this kind of learning. You might say, with a mom who's a, who's a music teacher and a dad who at one point in time majored in music in college, he has an identity around music. And I don't say all of this to brag, I promise, <laughs> just, just to ask again, do habits shape identity or does identity shape our habits? And if the answer is really both, if it's a little of both and both and they inform each other, what habits are we choosing for our kids and for ourselves as Christians? Are we fostering that identity by our actions? Because I'm worried our answers to that, those questions are not very satisfying. That most dads today are more excited to go out in the backyard and toss the pigskin than they are to sit down with their kids and read the small catechism. I bet most of us enjoy many things more than studying Scripture, our focus today. And I don't think it's a controversial thing for me to say this, but I think it's true. So if we have Christian identity, why isn't it shaping us more in these ways? You know, when we were exploring options for our congregational study, weighing eight different options or whatever, and we came to the being challenged, the pastors were really kind of worried as, that as much as we liked the study, people would hear, pastor wants us to pray more. Pastor wants us to read our Bible more. Pastor wants us to come to church. I've heard all of that. I can skip church for the next six weeks. We were worried that you'd tune out, that you wouldn't engage. And I'm glad that the majority of you have engaged, have bought the book. I, I like to think you're reading it too. But... I'm very glad to see the response that we've had, but, but we were genuinely worried, and yet as I've read the study myself, I've, as I've done the daily challenges and done the workbook for myself, I've been so edified by the readings. So many things that Zach Zender says in this study are, are poignant and pointed and meaningful to our current culture. They're hitting me where I am, and I hope that's true for you too. But even as much as I appreciate it, I have to admit that when Friday rolled around this week, I said to myself, oh, I forgot to read yesterday. And then I looked in my book and I realized I had forgotten to read for four days straight. Maybe some of you can relate. But as I, as I realized this and I scrutinized my habits and I thought about what we were attempting to do, I sat down and said to myself, no, I'm going to catch up this time. <laughs> I certainly didn't last year. But I'm going to catch up this time, and I was so glad that I did, because again, those readings were pointed, and they were meaningful, and they hit home. 
They brought home that I needed to commit to community and that there are ways that I was falling short. And I analyzed my relationships, not just here, but at home. I, I asked hard questions and the scripture passages are starting out strong this week too. If you relate to what I just said, please do consider catching up. Please do consider reading what you've missed. Each of those days has been good. But if you can't do that, if you don't have time or if you can't bring yourself to know that when we're talking about habits, the best day to start is yesterday or maybe 20 years ago. The second best day is today. There's nothing wrong with starting a good habit today. It's a good habit, right? And if we keep putting it off, we'll never get it done. Good habits like, like reading God's Word, I don't think anybody naturally enjoys them. Exercising God's Word, these things aren't naturally enjoyed. You learn to enjoy them. And if you out there have that love of God's Word, if you read God's Word and it's a habit for you every single day, please know that this is a precious gift of God. Please continue to foster it, embrace it, recognize that it is a gift of the Holy Spirit and treasure that fact. But if you don't love it, if you read Adam begat and you say, oh, I can't do this again, you're not alone. You're not alone. The sin in you wants you not to read. The devil wants you not to read the scriptures and it will give you every option, every excuse not to do so. Even lifelong Christians find this good habit difficult. But there's never a bad day to start. There's never a bad day to develop a love for the scriptures to realize what's in the blessing that we have in this book. The disciples had to learn this. Jesus opened their mind to understand the scriptures and until then had no idea the truth that they contained and all the promises therein. Martin Luther had to learn this. He dreaded reading the Bible because all he saw in it was a righteous God who was angry at him until one day he found in that book a loving and gracious and wonderful good God. You are not alone if you struggle, but don't give up. For in that same book, we see a person who never needed to develop good habits, Jesus. Because the only time we see Jesus as a child, where is he? In the temple, in the temple learning, studying the scriptures, exercising good habits, and even then, People are amazed at his understanding, his wisdom, his knowledge. He's talking with people, adults, and, and they're marveling at him. So, speaking of child prodigies, Jesus is a good example. But Jesus is not just a child prodigy of the Bible. Jesus is living out who he knows he is supposed to be. He's living out the identity that he had chosen for himself and which God had set as his target from the day he was born. The true purpose of Jesus' life was not just mastering scripture, but saving you. And so Jesus, as Savior, Messiah, Lord, friend, he lived the life that he lived every single day cultivating good habits, the habits that we will hear about again and again and again as we continue this study. And we will find in him a person who lived not just good habits, but a perfect life, who fulfilled the fullness of the law, died on the cross, and rose again to new life. That whether we live perfect lives or not, whether we read our scriptures every single day or not, we can know with confidence that God has saved us. He died for you. What does that make you? What identity does that mean you have but a beloved, treasured child of God? So rest in all of these promises. Crack open that Bible to find out who he is and who you are as well. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord.
Amen. Please pray with me. Dear God, thank you for Jesus' dedication to the Scriptures. Help us to share that same dedication to your Word, to the Bible, to reading it. And open our minds as we read them, just like you opened the minds of the disciples. Help us to see in these words who Jesus is, who we are, and to rest in all of the promises. Jesus Christ is our light, our strength, our song. He alone is our hope. And so we sing.